Welcome to Pathagonia. This is Jay. Today we are going to talk about interesting cytology cases. In our last effusion video, we talked about bronchoalveolar lobage adequacy, which are the presence of alveolar macrophages, because that's how you know you are in the alveolar component. Right now, what you see here is a pleural effusion, a very cellular one. But we, before we talk about this case, let's talk about effusions in general. Where can we sample effusions? I like to think about the three P's, pericardium, peritoneum, and pleura. And where, or I guess before we begin as to which site would be the most reactive, what are, let's talk about the population of cells in the pericardium, peritoneum, and pleura. You have mesos, and let's see if we can identify a meso here. Maybe this is a meso right here. They'll have a lacy skirt appearance, and that's because they have surface microvilli. They can have prominent nucleoli. They can be multinucleated, especially if they're reactive and they can take on a phagocytic role. In effusions, you can get them as single cells or uh, pairs. In washings, that's the surgeon basically getting analogous pressure hose and hosing down the mesothelial layer. So in that case, it comes down in sheets and honeycombs. One of the scary thing about mesos are when it is activated, they can have prominent nucleoli. Um, their cell size can be larger and they can have this two-toned cytoplasm. Here's a better view of some mesos. So you can see, appreciate just a little bit of the two-toned cytoplasm. You can see the prominent nucleoli at this view. There's a multinucleated one right here. And sometimes they can have mites as well, but these are just reactive and they're not cancerous. So here is a PAP of mesos, and here we can see some multinucleation. We can see some binucs here, and you can appreciate the microvilli here, that frilly skirt appearance. Other cells that we can get are include histiocytes, which are smaller than mesos. Let's see if we can pick one out here. Can't seem to pick one out here, but they are smaller. They have kind of a curved nuclei. Maybe this is one? I would have to look closer. Um, in addition, you can have lymphocytes. Here are some lymphocytes right here, much smaller, and they just have a thin rim of cytoplasm. So in terms of uh, which mesos are the most reactive in the pericardium, peritoneum, and pleura, you guessed it, it's the pericardium because the heart bangs the pericardium incessantly, and that's going to lead to some reactive mesos. To stay for mesos, you can use a D240, calretinin, CK56, WT1, CK7, AE1, AE3 on the cell block. And here is a cell block. Again, these mesos, presumed mesos, look very scary with three prominent nucleoli. This cluster of cells I'm favoring to be mesos for the main reason being that they have these windows. It's a bit subtle, but once you get the hang of it, you can appreciate these windows. And that's because of the microvilli, as previously mentioned. And you can see it maybe just a little bit here. And if you are concerned about adenocarcinoma, look for a second population on your cell block or your effusion diff quick and pap. Adenos generally have smooth borders, they're 3D, they have nuclei that kind of pooch out of the cytoplasm. There are no windows. An 
And if you're unsure, as we were in this case, if it's malignant or benign, you can do the big four at our institution, at least. Um, you can do a Mach 31, which is, this is the control. The, a good positive should have a crisp membranous, just like the we see in this control. A Burrett 4, which also has membranous. And those two will stain epithelial cells, including adenocarcinoma. You want to remember for Mach 31, it will be negative if you are concerned for metastatic hepatocellular carcinoma because HCC uh, is negative for Mach 31. It is positive for CAM 5.2. And then the mesothelial cells will stain CK56 as well as calretin. So let's look at the Mach 31 first. Here's our cell block. Compared to the control, this is negative. There's no crisp membranous staining. Here is our Burrett 4, and it is also negative, and it should also have a crisp membranous staining. So this tells you that those cells are mesos. And to further strengthen that case, this is a CK56, which, should, which has a cytoplasmic stain, and you can see all these cells in the uh, cell block are highlighted by the CK56. And then calretinin should be nuclear and cytoplasmic cyto uh, positivity, which we see in this case. So this was signed out as benign. Here's another effusion. And as you can see here, this is a much better view. There's, it's a scant cellularities, but if when there is a clump of cells, we appreciate that they're mainly EOs. So unlike PALs where we typically give the percentage of what cell constitutes, we don't necessarily do that on BALs, but it does give a differential. We do mention that there are predominantly EOs present and that gives the clinician a differential. Um, with EOs, you can see them in pneumothorax, prior procedure, hypersensitivity, and infection. If you see a lot of lymphs, on the other hand, you could see lymphoma, metastasis, tubercul tuberculosis, and chylus effusion. So let's go on to another case. Let's go to a lung mass case where they did a biopsy. So around 70% of lung carcinoma is inoperable, and that's where cytopathologists can really help the patient. With a biopsy, we can tell them if it's lung adenocarcinoma, small cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma. But let's talk about lung adeno. There are three particular mutations we really want to test for. They are EGFR, ALK, ROS1. The reason why is that can drive therapy. With EGFR, you can give tyrosine kinase receptor, um, including erlotinib. You can also give uh, crizotinib if you have an ALK and ROS1 mutation. So as we see here on this diff quick, it's hard to see, but you don't really see any nuclear detail. And I presume this to be just necrosis. So I don't think I would call this adequate if I were at the site and they asked me, are we lesional? Here, I would say we are lesional. We have this cohesive group with prominent anisonucleosis. For instance, compare this cell to this cell. Even the, just the macronucleoli is the size of this cell. And you could probably put like five or six out at the very least into this cell. In addition, there's lack of mucin or goblet cells. So just from this picture, I'm favoring non-mucinous adeno. Um, it is not cohesive, discohesive, which is a buzzword and a pattern we see in small cell. So I, I do favor this to be adeno. I don't appreciate any Robin's egg blue cytoplasm nor any keratinocytes or um, uh, very uh, spaced uh, spaces between the cells, which I would expect in squamous cell. Okay, here's another uh, sample of the lesion and you still continue to have anisonucleosis with prominent nucleoli. 
Again, I don't see any prominent yeast. And here again, we see this large, very large cell. And compared to this cell, you can probably put eight or nine of them. And here's a cell block. Um, so this is favored to be adenocarcinoma. And we can do staining for this, including TTF1 napsin. Uh, it is important to note that for non-mucinous lung adenocarcinoma, at least on when you're on surge path, you can have different histologic subpatterns, including lipidic, which is along the alveolar walls. If you had all of this here, then I think I would favor lipidic. Uh, you can have acinar, you can have papillary, micropapillary, and solid pattern. Um, it's important to note that mucinous carcinoma is almost never positive for EGFR mutation, but does show KRAS mutation. And here is our TTF1 napsin. So TTF1 should stain the cells of interest uh, nuclear stain, and the napsin will be the cytoplasm of the cells of interest, and also the alveolar macrophages. Okay. So the, I guess before we finish, I just want to let you know, the thing that's hard about uh, cytology for lung specimens is it's hard to appreciate the architecture. Um, you can appreciate how cohesive they are, but you know, it's hard to tell if they're a papillary, micropapillary. Um, okay, let's go on to another case. This is a patient with a liver lesion and hepatocytes can be tricky because they're epithelioid, basically meaning they have a central nucleus surrounded by abundant cytoplasm. So maybe here. They can have binucleation. They can have a little bit of anisonucleosis, especially if they're reactive. Uh, they can have pigment like lipofuscin, and they can plus or minus have inkies. And so you want to be, if there's a tumor that can look like liver, you've got to be especially careful. So here we see a cell that's just completely blacked out by some pigment. We see some multi giant multinucleated cell with pleomorphism compare this nuclei to this nuclei and we have some plasma cytoid cytology here here's another set, uh, view so we have some binucs here they kind of look like bug-eyed bug eyes here uh, we have some inkies we have some vacuolization we have some cohesive groups and those continued plasma cytoid cells, along with that another cell that's completely darkened by pigment as well as this cell. Here we see kind of a trabeculated pattern, but intermixed within are these very pigmented cells, almost ink black. We see these very bizarre giant multinucleated cells, prominent anisonucleosis, maybe um, two binuc, maybe like a bug-eyed right there, as well as maybe a mitotic figure here. So uh, this was a metastatic melanoma case. Uh, this was positive for S100. The cells of interest were positive for S100 and SOX10. Here is the cell block. This is the just reactive hepatocytes. As you can see, there is anisonucleosis. Compare this nuclei to this nuclei. Um, and it makes sense because there is some inflammation in the background. It is pink as well. And then here I thought it was a good juxtaposition of some hepatocytes as well as some 
of the pigmented cells and kind of the cells with a dusky gray cytoplasm that has the cytologic features of melanocytes and melanoma in particular. So this is a very difficult, if not for the pigment, uh, this would have been an extremely difficult case. Uh, melanos, melanoma cells can be epithelioid or plasma cytoid as we had seen. They can be pleomorphic and have multinucleated cells with or minus inkies. Uh, they, uh, from one study, it's been shown that metastatic melanoma, only less than 50% of cases have pigment. So I guess in a way, we, uh, it was easier to diagnose for us because of the pigment. And then you wanna look out for those demon bug-eyed cells. So pretend this is the head. You can see those two very large bug-eyed, widely separated eyes. Here's a better bug-eyed demon cell here. And that's also seen in um, metastatic melanoma. All right. Lastly, let's talk about thyroids. As mentioned prior, Adequacy for thyroid is six groups of 10 or more follicles. The exceptions are if you have a nodule that's sampled and has a lot of colloid or a lot of inflammation or even just one or a very small group of cellular atypia that will bump you up to adequate, even if you don't have six groups of 10 or more uh, follicular cells. So in this FNA, diff quick, we see a granuloma. So granuloma, to identify them on cyto, you want to look for epithelioid histiocytes, meaning there's abundant cytoplasm and they're not necessarily, they're not plasma cytoid. And some of them have kind of curved nuclei to the point where it looks like a boomerang, as you can see here. And granulomas, mind you, is in its most broad sense, chronic inflammation. Your cells, histiocytes, trying to block off some ideology, some foreign body, some infection. Granulomas and thyroids suggest that it's granulomatous thyroiditis, otherwise known as subacute thyroiditis, otherwise known as de Quervian's thyroiditis, which is thought to be a viral ideology. Okay. Let's go into, on to another thyroid case. Uh, I just want to mention before we begin, the Bethesda category three AUS is atypical cells of uncertain significance. And basically in its broadest sense, that's when you have architectural or cytologic atypia, but not enough for you to call it suspicious for follicular neoplasm or suspicious for malignancy or malignant. However, that being said, it's you're not confident enough to just call it benign. And that's why AUS Bethesda category three exists. Let's talk about these cells. These cells are truly polygonal and epithelial. They have central nuclei with abundant cytoplasm. And here's another path of another group of these cells. They can have prominent nucleoli pinpoint, but there, there are no, generally no macronucleoli. They have this granular cytoplasm. So these are oncocytic cells. And because this sample did not have abundant or any in that, and for that matter, colloid, did not have significant inflammation and just had these oncocytic cells but not very cellular. This was called Bethesda category three, uh, atypia of uncertain significance. Now that being said, if this sample were very cellular and had only these oncocytic cells, then we can bump it up to suspicious for follicular neoplasm, comma, oncocytic type. Bethesda category four. 
In addition, uh, your differentials include other oncocytic entities, including uh, PTC, a papillary thyroid carcinoma oncocytic type. Now let's go on to another specimen. Here we see a group of follicular cells that are larger than your neutrophils. And typically they should be around the same size as the as a red blood cell, as a neutrophil. Here we also see very large cells. They're crowding, they're overlapping, there's prominent nucleoli, um, and again, they're larger than your neutrophils. And here is what I would say is a microfollicle. It has one, it has less than 15 cells. It's forming more than two-thirds of a circle, and it's crowded and flat. So without abundance of these, but seeing these in the specimen, we call this a US, but that's the category three. Here's a pap of that, uh, those suspicious follicular cells. You can see a little bit of overlapping here. And then here, I just want to bring to you some artifactual uh, confounding when you have these naked nuclei. This is due to air drying artifact and kind of looks like the faded genes look. And you just want to be careful to note that and not let that sway you to call it Bethesda category three. As you can see here, it's just naked nuclei. And going back, it has a dark, the more um, non air dried specimen it has darker color. All right, lastly, this is another thyroid specimen. And from the get-go, it's really cohesive. There's some background. This is just gel. But comparing this, lymph this inflammatory cell to this cell, I think you could put four or five. So from the get-go, it's very enlarged. And then here's the pap. And we can see an inky right here. We can see an inky right here. They're overlapping, they're crowded here. And they kind of have this papilleroid architecture. So this was called Bethesda category six, malignant, and uh, it was papillary thyroid carcinoma. All right, well, thank you for listening to this episode of Pathagonia. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it, and until next time,